Thank you so much, Dr. Offit, for leading our session today and agreeing to speak with us. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. For our first question, can you explain how a vaccine works? Right, so the goal of a vaccine is to induce the immunity that is a consequence of natural infection without having to pay the price of natural infection. So the way that's done is to take either the virus or the bacteria that you're interested in preventing and, and weakening it so much so that it can't possibly induce disease but can still induce immunity. That's how they work. So they're all natural. Thank you for that. What are some reasons people give for not wanting to vaccinate their children? I think the biggest reason is people aren't scared of the diseases anymore. I think vaccines are largely a victim of their own success. And I think to some people, they think, you know, when I was, was younger, we only got a few vaccines. Now, you know, I'm older and I'm watching my kids get so many vaccines. And there's more of these chronic diseases out there that I'd never heard of before, like autism. And, and couldn't those two things be um, associated? And it's fine. I think it's always fine to ask the question, right? My child was fine. They got a vaccine. Now they're not fine. Could it be the vaccine that, that has done that? And that's an answerable question. You can answer that in a scientific venue by looking at large numbers of children who did or didn't get a vaccine to see whether or not there's an increased incidence of any of these disorders in the vaccinated group. And consistently, time and time again, vaccines have been shown to be safe. So usually uh, that can alleviate those parents' concerns. When a parent says, it's my child, my decision, what do you say to them? Well, the, the issue is um, they're not just making a decision for their child. When, when a parent chooses not to vaccinate a child, they're making a decision also for those with whom their child comes in contact. I guess the question comes down to, in part, should it be your right to allow your child to catch and to transmit a potentially fatal infection? I think the answer to that question is no. What are consequences of parents choosing not to vaccinate? The major consequence of choosing not to vaccinate is you get the vaccine preventable disease. We're seeing that now. When parents choose not to vaccinate, um, it's always measles that comes back first because it's the most contagious of the vaccine preventable diseases, and that's what we're seeing. We have more than 1,100 cases of measles in this country when in the year 2000, you know, 20 years ago, um, we had no cases. So this is what happens when you choose not to vaccinate. And it's a dangerous game we play. I mean, there were uh, as many as five children in the intensive care unit in New York with measles. Get to, get to a couple thousand cases and we'll start to see children dying of measles again. How do you deal with the clash between science and politics? Um, it's hard to watch politicians, I think, weigh in uh, on scientific issues for, with which they have little expertise. I mean, it's hard to watch, for example, a politician during a debate say that they think vaccines cause autism when there's clear evidence that they don't. So um, I, don't, I wonder why politicians do that. I think they're trying to pander to a group of people who they believe will support them. But if they really want to benefit society, what they should do is stand up for science, stand up for scientific studies and scientific expertise, because to counter that expertise is only to cause harm. I mean, to claim, for example, that climate change isn't real denies all the evidence that we have. To claim that evolution isn't real and that creationism is, is to deny all the evidence that we have. In that case, 250,000 years of fossil records. So I think it's a dangerous game we play when we choose to deny science. And with climate change, it's a very dangerous game that we play. Can a virus mutate away from a vaccine? Yes, I think there's probably no better example of that than influenza. I mean, every year, independent of whether you've been vaccinated or nationally infected the previous year, you need to get another um, uh, vaccine to handle those strains that have mutated from the previous year. Influenza is an elusive virus. I actually trained in an influenza lab way back when in the early 1980s in Wistar, and the person who was the head of the lab, Walter Gerhardt, said to me something I'll never forget. He said, if you want to have a research career for the rest of your life, study influenza because that is one moving target. Interesting. What is the cause of measles and why is it so dangerous? Right, so measles is caused by a virus um, that can infect the lungs causing severe and occasionally fatal pneumonia. It can infect the brain causing severe and occasionally fatal encephalitis, which just means inflammation in the brain. It can cause severe dehydration, which is a water loss, which can be fatal. It's a bad, highly contagious virus. I mean, I had measles when I was younger and I lived, which is why we're having this interview, but not everybody did. 500 people died a year of measles and 48,000 would be hospitalized before uh, there was a vaccine. And firstly, first, for the most part, no one got to age 15 without having been infected with measles. How did scientists figure out that controlled infection could prevent disease? 
Right, so I think what, what people knew from early days, from the smallpox days, is that there, there were people who, who had relatively severe and relatively milder forms of the disease. And so if you look at the early days of smallpox, I mean, from like a couple centuries ago, what they would do is they would take the, the blisters from people who had had a relatively mild case of smallpox, and then they would ground them up, and then they would either inject them into the vein or they would inhale that ground up material. Um, that was called variolation. So basically you took what you think was a less virulent strain or less uh, pathogenic or dangerous strain of the, in this case, a virus, and, and caused people to be variolated. I mean, so for example, Ben Franklin in uh, the early 1700s had his five-year-old son die of, of smallpox. And he, he lamented the fact that he hadn't variolated his child. Now, this is before vaccination. I mean, the, the first vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, was made from cowpox virus, which was a virus that was similar enough to human smallpox smallpox, that infection with one could protect you against disease caused by the other. This was really sort of, uh, the variolation was sort of a weakened form of smallpox just because the, that particular infection wasn't that severe. It's really giving smallpox to prevent smallpox. And, you know, occasionally people would die from that, but he lamented that. How did you get interested in this career path? I think um, we're all shaped by events in our childhood. I mean, I was in a polio ward when I was five years old, and um, this was at a time when um, the people were scared to death of polio. I didn't have polio. I had just had an operation uh, on my foot. It was, I was born with club feet, which is a congenital abnormality, so I had to have that uh, my right foot operated on, and that kept, put me in the hospital for a number of weeks. And I was in a polio ward, and I remember it well. Um, it was a group of 20 other children. Um, they only had one visiting hour a week. My parents could come from two to three on Sundays, and that was it. And um, actually, my mother, as it turns out, was pregnant with my brother and had a complication, so she never came. My father actually uh, came once, but then he sort of violated one of the rules, so they didn't let him come anymore. So no one came. So for a week after week after week, I was sort of in that polio were looking at these other kids who were certainly far worse off than me and then seeing them as vulnerable and helpless and alone. I think that drew me to pediatrics. I think it drew me to pediatric infectious diseases. And I remember when I was um, at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, we actually rotated through that chronic care facility when I was a medical student. And I remember going into the room that was that ward. It wasn't a ward anymore. It wasn't a polio ward anymore because by the time I went to medical school, we'd largely eliminated polio from this country. But it was an office building. But that, that room was still exactly the same. And there was a window right next to my bed that looked out onto the, the, uh, the main entrance to the hospital. And I would just stare at that, that window waiting for my parents to come, which they never did for week after week. And I remember walking over to that window and looking out at that, uh, that door and, you know, fighting back tears as an adult because we are shaped by those scars of our childhood. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer our questions. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Carissa.